Okay, can you hear me now? Still no sound, huh? Uh, I can hear you. Okay, all right. Everybody can hear me if one person can hear me. I can hear too. Okay, thank you. I, I can uh, <clears throat> go ahead and start then. Some other students will probably join in along the way. So first thing I'm gonna do is I share my screen with you. All right. Do you guys see exam one review session on the screen on your screen? Yes. Great. All right. So. Um, Thanks for coming on. Um, I don't have any questions for you, but I'm sure you might have some questions for me. But uh, what I'm gonna do for the next hour or so is just quickly run through a few slides, summarizing um, the first four chapters for you. I can't cover everything but I'll try my best to uh, touch upon the, the high points of the, um, of the first four chapters. Um, is there a ch chat box showing up anywhere on your screen? Anybody see a chat box? Uh, I could pull one up. Yes, uh, somebody type in, um, type in something on the chat box to see if it works. Okay, I, I see it now, okay. All right, so there's uh, two ways you can um, get back to me along the way, either type in a chat message or you, you can try to interrupt me by speaking into your speaker. <clears throat> we'll see how it goes, right? Whatever is more, more efficient. Okay, before I get started, does anybody have any questions at all? Let me check. Okay, let me let me do it this way. Does anybody have any questions? Type in yes or no in the chat box. Would now be a good time to ask a question about the uh, formatting of the test, or should I say that till the end? Okay, I see a couple of response. Yeah, so you know this is um, a Zoom session, so it's it's not the um, most efficient way of running a meeting, but uh, we'll see how it goes. All right, so nobody has any questions, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of briefly touch upon some of the key points. Uh, in each of the chapters for you that you should uh, kind of know for the exam. Okay, so, that, so, so let's get started. Okay, how, how's that look on your screen? Does that look okay? Yes. Okay, so uh, before I... Um, get into the details of each chapter. Let's just summarize briefly what it is that you learned in the first four chapters. And so this is kind of um, a summary in a chart form of what was covered in uh, chapters one through four. So first is chapter one. Chapter one, which basically talked about, you know, the concept of uh, business transaction. A, a, a business transaction is an economic transaction uh, where the um, activity has a, has a monetary impact on the company. 
a monetary impact, meaning it has a dollar impact uh, to the company. So for example, if a company pays salaries to employ, that is considered a business transaction. So that, that was covered in chapter one, basic concepts, generally accepted accounting principles, um, different types of business entities. Chapter two is actual accounting, um, what I call the bookkeeping process. Now, some of you are maybe have exposure to uh, bookkeeping, but basically it's learning uh, how to take a transaction and convert it into a, into a journal entry. And then after you journalize a transaction, you have to post it to a ledger account. And this is going on throughout the accounting period, which is generally usually a month cycle. I mean, every day transactions are occurring in a business and the accountant or bookkeeper is journalizing the transactions and then usually at the end of the accounting cycle, which is at the end of the month, they post, post all the transactions to the ledger. At that point, they're going to uh, summarize everything that happened during this accounting period and prepare a trial balance. Now, that was basically the gist of chapter two. Okay, once trial balance is completed, then there's some additional steps they have to be made before they can actually prepare financial statements. That is journalizing and posting adjusting entries, which is the bulk of uh, chapter three, and then preparing a trial balance. So this is uh, basically the steps that have to be done during the accounting period in order to summarize what happened during the accounting period in the form of financial statements, which is the, the topic of chapter four. And once financial statements are finished or prepared, then the accountant can uh, close the books for the next accounting period. So then we have to journalize and post what we call closing entries. And then there's the uh, post-closing trial balance. Okay, so that's basically what, what um, is covered in the first four chapters. And I hope most of you are familiar with that by now if you um, work through all the assignments. Okay, so anybody have any questions? No questions, okay. So let's just briefly walk through some of the highlights of chapter one, which is analyzing business transactions. So you, you should remember by now that there's basically three steps involved in the uh, accounting process. That is analyzing transactions or identifying transactions of economic events. Second is to record those transactions in the uh, company accounting records. When you record something, you're recording, and then eventually you're gonna have to classify and summarize that data that's been recorded. And then you need to prepare financial statements to report what happened to the company during the uh, accounting cycle. And oftentimes the accountant is the, is the person that has to communicate to the users, which are basically uh, the owners or the managers of the company, stockholders, how things went during the accounting period. Okay, so in uh, discussing the um, concept of accounting, you should have learned that in a company, a company is made up of assets. Assets 
are generally paid for by liabilities, borrowing from the bank or borrowing from, uh, from uh, other sources or paying employees uh, uh, later, they have liabilities. And assets um, have to equal all the liabilities of the company plus the stockholders' equity. Now, when you talk about stockholders' equity, you see the term stockholders means we're talking about a corporation, form of business. If you see the uh, term owner's equity, then we're talking about a sole proprietorship company that's owned by one person. So this is basically everything you do has to follow this um, equation. Now, if you wanna expand the equation, the stockholders equity is a little complicated because it consists of your only common stock plus retained earnings and retained earnings is made up of the company's revenues over the life of the company, minus all of expenses, minus any dividends that were paid out to the stockholders. Now, um, anybody in the on the uh, in the session have any stocks? Anybody own any stocks in publicly traded corporations? Yes, GameStop to the moon. Okay, so you know that. If you own a share of stock, a corporation can pay you some of the profits back in the form of dividends. But before they can pay you back some of the profits in the form of dividends, they have to make revenues and they have to um, incur expenses to get those revenues. So all of this is recorded, summarized in the uh, retained earnings account. Okay, <clears throat> so... Again, the um, accounting equation provides the underlying framework for recording and summarizing all the economic events of the company business from the day it started business. And just to give you a simple example of how you can look at this equation in, in a real simple term, a company may own some equipment and it maybe went and borrowed some money from the uh, bank to pay for that equipment. So this equipment you see on here, this tractor, which costs $30,000, the company might have gone out and took a loan out from the bank. That's the liability associated with this equipment. And then the owner, pumped in $30,000 or $10,000 of his own cash to pay for it. So in this case, in its simplest form, the equipment is funded by a loan plus some of the owner's own equity or its own cash. And you know in business world that the claims of the creditor must always be paid before the claims of the owner. So in this case, if the company were to go bankrupt, they would have to pay off the bank first, and then the owner would get whatever is left over. Okay, then that's a um, basic concept of running a business. Okay, so um, here's the expanded chart on uh, stockholders equity that I was talking about a few minutes ago. Stockholders equity is a term that you will um, be exposed to more and more as we move into the later chapters, uh, particularly uh, chapter 10 and 11. Where we're gonna talk about corporations in a little bit more detail. So uh, any type of investment by stockholders increases stockholders' equity. Investments generally are cash. So if you are interested in buying 
shares in a publicly traded company like Apple or um, Amazon or Facebook, you can go uh, to your broker and you can put an order in to buy as many shares as you want. But those shares will cost you money. So that money that you give up to get the shares of, let's say, Apple, one share or two shares or 20 shares or 100 shares, will increase Apple stockholders' equity because that's money going into the corporation for its use, for its business use. Okay, now the other uh, item that can increase stockholders' equity is revenues. Revenues are basically the gross sales from business activity. The business is is uh, is doing. For example, Apple just announced uh, iPhone 13, so it's not out yet, but it will be out in a few weeks. And when they start selling those new phones. That's going to increase the company's uh, revenues, which translates in an increase in stockholders' equity. So revenues are basically uh, sales of its products or services. <clears throat> and you can include in um, revenues, fees, services, commissions, interest, dividends, royalties, and rent. So those are the two basic things that will increase stockholders' equity. What decreases stockholders' equity? Dividends. And as I said earlier, dividends are nothing more than a return of the company's profits back to the shareholder. So if you purchased shares in Apple Computer Company, you will get a dividend back from the corporation. And they will, in other words, they will give you a slice of their profits as rewarding you for being their shareholder. So that's going to decrease the equity. And then the last thing that will decrease equity is expenses. In order to get revenues, make revenues, the company obviously has to incur expenses, such as salaries, rent, utilities, et cetera. So that's basically how stockholders' equity works. Everything that the company does, sales, running its business, incurring expenses, giving part of its profits back to the shareholder is going to impact the stockholder's equity. And when investors put money into the company through the purchase of stock, that's going to increase stockholder's equity. So I just spent a few minutes on this because some, sometimes this can be a little confusing if you've never been exposed to uh, the stock market. Okay, so here's a simple problem I'm just gonna walk you through <clears throat> uh, in terms of uh, journalizing the transaction. So here, here's a, a simple problem where there's four, five transactions <coughs> and, I, and you're supposed to journalize the transaction. So let's take the first one. Stockholders purchase shares of stock for $25,000. Does anybody know how this impacts the assets, liability, stockholders equity chart on the screen here? I know um, it's kind of hard. I just want to kind of get a um, sense of, of if, if you know what to do. You can just chat, type, chat it in, type it in in chat box. How do we record stockholders investing $25,000 cash in the company? Okay, debit cash, credit, comma, stock. Okay, good. So that's basically what you learn in um, this chapter. So you see that the... Um, Assets equal liability plus stockholders equity. We plus cash on the asset side and we plus common stock on the stockholders equity side. So, so assets still equals liability plus stockholders equity. Company purchased 
$7,000 office equipment on credit. Okay, how do we record that? Okay, great, debit accounts payable and credit or I mean, debit equipment and credit accounts payable. Everything stays in balance. How about receive $8,000 cash in exchange for services performed? Okay, this is a situation where the company provided or completed some services. So they earned some revenues and they were paid in cash. So we record that under revenue. Okay, company paid $850 in rent. Anybody? Okay. So in this situation, we have a, an expense, the monthly rent, and they paid it with cash. So we're going to reduce cash, and we're going to reduce stockholders' equity by showing a minus 850 under the expense column. Paid a dividend of $1,000 to stockholders. Paid dividend $1,000 to stockholders, okay, so there was a dividend involved. So in this case, we're gonna, again, show a minus to the cash account, and then a minus to stockholders equity under dividend. So you see that uh, everything at the end of the day, when you summarize the assets, liabilities, and equity, everything stays in balance. Okay, so this is just a simple problem. You should be familiar with this concept of assets equal liability plus stockholders equity. Okay, moving on to uh, chapter two. Now we start getting a little technical. We get into the recording process. So in chapter two, we covered the uh, concept of journalizing a transaction and then posting those transactions to a ledger accounts and then preparing the trial balance from the ledger accounts. So these are uh, the steps involved in getting your transactions that you analyzed in chapter one onto the accounting records by journalizing the transactions and then journalizing or posting and copying those over to the ledger and then running off a trial balance from the ledger. So what is an account? Okay, so when you uh, record a transaction, you have to know that all transactions are kept in the accounting records through the uh, accounts. So there are accounts for expenses, liabilities, equity, revenue, et cetera. And an account is basically a record. And in this uh, day and age, a record in your computer file. And it's generally, uh, you can visualize it as the letter T where every account has a name and it has a left side and a right side. The left side is called the debit side. The right side is called the credit side. Okay, what you learn is that a debit to an account can represent an increase or decrease. 
depending on what type of account it is. A credit to an account can represent an increase or decrease depending on what type of account you're working with. So if you look at the actual structure of an account in the accounting ledger, this is what it basically looks like. You have the name and usually you're assigning it a number because in the computer, everything requires a number to keep track of it. There's a column for a date, explanation, a reference column, a debit column, a credit column, and a running balance. So the name in this case is cash. The number assigned to the cash account is 101. There's debits entries and there's credit entries. So that means that when there's debit entries, money is coming into the company because it increases the cash account. And when there's credit entries, money is leaving the company to like, for example, to pay bills or to pay salaries, it decreases the balance. And then you have the running balance. So you can see that the running balance started off with $25,000 debit. And then there was an $8,000 credit. And so it re reduced by 8,000 to 17. <clears throat> and all the way down you have at the end of the month, you have a running balance of 9,450. Okay. So now that you're familiar with what an account is, you, then you need to understand the concept of debits and credits. And in this concept, you have to understand what we mean by the double entry system. Double entry system basically means for every transaction you're gonna record, you have to make a double entry. A double entry is a debit to one account and a credit to another account. Or it could mean two debits to, one, uh, two, debits to two accounts and one credit to one account as long as the debits and the credits are the same in total, it doesn't matter how many accounts you have, but you need to make at least a debit to one account and a credit to another account. So as I said, right, you gotta affect two or more accounts to keep the accounting equation in balance. You have to debit one account, credit another account, and always, debits got to equal the credit. So if you put $100 in one account as a debit, you need to put $100 in another account as a credit. Or if you put $100 in one account as a debit and you put $50 as a credit to another account, you need to put $50 to another account as a credit to keep it in balance. All right, so this is basically how the um, debit and credit rules work. If you're dealing with assets, asset accounts, a debit to an asset account is gonna increase the account and a credit to the asset account is gonna decrease the account. Likewise for liabilities, a debit to a liability account is gonna decrease the account balance and the credit to the liability account is gonna increase the account balance. And for equities, it works like liabilities, debits reduced equities and credits increase equity. So this is the rules you gotta understand. And every account has a normal balance. In this case, the normal balance for assets is always debit balance. So you have a cash account that has a debit balance of $1,000, that's the balance. If you have an asset account like cash with a credit balance of $1,000, then that's not right. Because normally you can't have a negative cash balance in your accounts. So that's why the asset account is normally a debit balance. Same goes for liabilities. The normal balance should always be a credit. And for equities, the normal balance should always be a credit. So you have to... Uh, Make sure you understand these rules when you're doing double entry accounting. Now you look at equity. Equity, of course, is always a little bit more complicated because there are three, four components that make up your equity balance in total. As I said from the previous slide, the equity balance 
is normally a credit balance in total. But you see that equity is made up of four categories, common stock, oh, the chat message. Equity accounts true for expenses, are they debit accounts? Uh, okay. You're going over it in this slide right now. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, got <laughs> it, okay. okay, all right, thank you. So common stock is gonna increase equity. So you would expect that to be a credit balance. Dividends decrease equity. Remember equity in total is normally a credit balance. And we just said common stock, money coming in from shareholders is gonna increase equity. That's gotta be a credit balance coming in. Dividends is money going out to the shareholder. That's gonna, oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping the gun here. Revenues uh, are also like common stock, increase equity. So those, remember those are the two things, two components that will increase your equity balance. On the other hand, dividends is just money flowing out of the corporation into the hands of the stockholder is gonna reduce equity. And usually what happens is you're gonna debit dividend account and you're gonna credit cash. That's where the double entry accounting is. Let's say the uh, Apple pays $100 dividend. It's gonna debit dividend account, which is gonna increase equity. And it's gonna credit the cash account, which is gonna decrease cash. So assets minus 100 cash is gonna equal equity uh, minus 100, which is the debit to the dividend account. And then you have expenses. Expenses always decrease equity because expenses are needed to be incurred in order to get revenues. So if you don't have expenses, generally you don't have revenues. So obviously then if revenues results in a credit to increase equity, expenses have to be debited to decrease equity. Example, let's say you have some salaries. You're gonna debit salary expense, gonna increase the salary expense account, which in this case will decrease equity. And you're gonna credit cash, which is a decrease to the cash account, which is on the asset side. Okay, is that help clarify that question you had? Oh yeah. Okay. So this is basically uh, a very um, complicated in the beginning when you're learning this. And really the only way you can really get this under control is just by doing the assignments and making errors and trying to go back and forth until you understand the logic behind it. Okay, so here's a, a simple uh, problem. To test your understanding of recording transactions. So this company, the president and sole stockholder, uh, Kate, Kate Brown engaged in the following activities in opening up her saloon. Here it is. She opened up a bank account in the name of the company and put in $20,000 of her own money in this account in exchange for shares of the company's common stock. Then she took some of that money and bought equipment on account, or I'm sorry, she bought some equipment on account. In other words, she didn't use any of this money, but she borrowed, she she borrowed money from the vendor um, for a total of forty eight hundred dollars, and then she interviewed three people for the position of hairstylist. How do we record this transaction? Okay, let's do the first one. How do I, how do I, what, how, how do I open up, how do I record the, um, the fact that the owner put in a $20,000 for shares of stock? Anybody? Okay, you're right on. Okay, great. Okay, so somebody already answered all the questions, all the entries. Ethan, yeah, great. Okay, so in this case, the entry would be to 
debit to cash account, credit, stockholders' equity, common stock. In the case of the equipment that they bought on the account, you would debit equipment and credit accounts payable. And then for the third entry where they interviewed three people, that is a transaction, but it's not an economic transaction because there's no money involved. So there's no entry. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Uh, let's do this one. This is trial balance. Prepare the um, trial balance for all the balances in all these accounts. <clears throat> all right, the first thing you had to know <clears throat> is what accounts have debit balances and what accounts have credit balances. And if, if you've been listening and you've been doing your assignments, you know that uh, equipment is an asset that would have a debit balance. Dividends is stockholders equity. That would be debit or credit, anybody. Debit or credit balance, stock uh, dividends. Anybody debit. care to go ahead? Debit. A debit column. That would be a debit balance, correct. Okay. And I think the other accounts payable is obviously a liability. Salaries and wage expense. Okay. What is salary and wages expense? Debit. Okay. What what does that fall under? Assets, liability, or stockholders' equity? Stockholders' equity. Oh, yeah. Who, who's speaking? Mina speaking. Okay. Thank you. I just uh, recognize, I want to recognize your voice. Okay. Thank you. Accounts receivable. It's an asset, so it's a debit. Service revenue. Debit or credit? Credit. Okay. That's part of stockholders' equity. Common stock. The stockholders equity, salary and wages payable, debit or credit? Credit. That's part of liabilities. Notes payable is obviously liability. Utility expense is stockholders equity, debit, and prepaid insurance, debit or credit? Credit. What is prepaid insurance, oh, anybody? Debit, debit. Okay, what is it? Asset liability or equity? Asset. That's an asset. That's a purchase of an insurance policy that's going to benefit future periods. And cash, of course, is an asset. Okay, now to do a trial balance, you have to know all of this a normal balance uh, accounts. Now, once you've identified whether the balance is normal debit or normal credit, then you can prepare a trial balance. And it's simply uh, putting together a, a, a report like this with a debit and credit column, name of the company, name of the financial statement, and the date or period ending, and listing out all your debits, and then all your credits, debits, credits, and summarizing the debits, and summarizing the credits and make sure that everything balances. If everything balances, then you know that the debits equal the credits. Does that mean that the it's correct? Does it mean that the trial balances information is correct? Anybody care to try and answer that? It means it doesn't mean it's correct. It just means that you added up everything on both sides the same. You could still uh, have made an error. You could. You still could have an error, even if it still balances because the entry that you might have made in the journal could have been to the wrong accounts. In other words, you could you could have made an entry to the uh, cash account when you should have put it into the supply account which means that even though you made the uh, journal entry correctly, debit, let's say, debit to the cash account and credit the liabilities, it should have been a debit to supplies and a credit to liability accounts payable. But because you made 
a hundred dollar debit to uh, to the cash account and a hundred dollar credit to the accounts payable, the debits still equal the credits. So when you do a trial balance, it's going to show the debits still equal the credits. But in fact, it's wrong because you used the wrong account when you recorded the debit to the cash. You should have used the supply account and debited it. So that's the, the um, issue with the trial balance. It's not going to tell you if your journal entries were correct or the balances in the accounts are correct. It's only going to tell you if the debits equal the credits. Now, so then you ask the question, well, what is, then why do you do a trial balance? Well, because this is the first um, attempt to look at what happened during the accounting period. And if you're a trained accountant, you can look at the trial balance and you can basically see if there's something wrong with the numbers. But of course, if you are looking at it for the first time, you wouldn't know. But if you're the accountant that's been doing all the journal entries and postings and uh, et cetera, this is your first kind of uh, attempt to check everything okay. Okay, here's a, another um, example of a trial balance problem. And I'm just gonna walk you through quickly, but usually what will happen is you'll be given information as to the balances at the end of the counting period. Now the balance of this case could be December 31st, it could be November 31st, it could be January 31st. It just depends on what period you're looking at. And it's gonna give you all the accounts, but it won't tell you if it's a debit or credit balance. You have to know if it's debit or or credit balance uh, from your training. And then all you got to do is just put the amounts uh, into the uh, trial balance. And from all your training, you know that cash accounts receivable supplies equipment are assets. So assets are normally normal balances, debit balance, and notes payable, accounts payable, salaries payable our liabilities and the normal balance, our credit balances, and then your stockholders equity accounts or your owner's equities accounts can be a combination of debit or credit normal balances. So all you need to do then is uh, input all the numbers from the top, assets, liabilities, owner's equity, drawing is debit, revenues, credit expenses are debits, add it up and everything balances, then you know from looking at the ledger balances that the debits equal the credits. Now, if the debits don't equal the credits, then you have to go back and find out where the error is. And that could be a very tedious process. But again, if you're the accountant, you can quickly go back to your um, ledger and your journal entries and kind of eyeball and see if everything looks in balance. And it's more or less something was not gonna be in balance if, it's, if the totals are not in balance. Okay, here's another quick problem where um, you're being given the trial balance and now they want you to uh, Summarize the transactions for January 2012 listed here. So here's the trial balance as of the end of the month, December 31. So that was the closing balance at the end of the year. And then they give you a bunch of transactions that were recorded or that were uh, incurred in January of the following month and ask you that you summarize or journalize all these transactions. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll kind of quickly walk you through that. So company paid advertising costs in cash. Basically what happens is you're gonna take some cash out and you're gonna incur an expense. So assets minus thousand, equity minus a thousand. So this entry would be debit expense advertising, 
credit cash asset a thousand. Next was acquired inventory. They bought some inventory on account for four thousand dollars. Okay, anybody know how that would be handled? What what would we what would we? Okay, I'll 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 take you through it first. So in this case, you would have inventory. Added four thousand, and you would have a liability for four thousand. Remember what he said, right? Additional repair parts, inventory, acquired on account four thousand dollars. That's the key word right there. Account. It didn't say cash. It said account. So that automatically should tell you this is a liability transaction where we're going to increase the asset. And we're going to de increase liability. So how would I record that? What would I debit? What would I credit? Anybody? Okay, debit inventory, credit accounts payable. All right. So that's kind of basically what you got to be able to do uh, on the exam <clears throat> is just take a transaction and journalize it. So next is miscellaneous expense paid in cash. This is a simple one. Asset went down, cash, and expenses went up $2,000, which reduces stockholders' equity. Debit, expense, credit, cash. Collected cash from a customer in payment of accounts receivable, $14,000. So you see here they have a $14,000 ending balance on December 31st. And it says that the customer in January paid off $14,000. So we're gonna do what? Anybody? We're going to debit cash and we're going to credit accounts to see. Oh, great. Okay. So this is pretty cut and dry now. Yeah. So you guys should know that. So you, so this is very interesting because you see that this transaction only affected one side of the accounting equation. The asset cash went up, collected $14,000 and the asset accounts receivable went down $14,000. Notice that there's no impact on the right side of the equation. So, so this is something that you should be familiar with in that an accounting transaction doesn't necessarily have to affect the two sides of the equation. It can affect only one side. In this case, it affected only the asset side, but everything still stayed in balance because when you take an asset cash and increase it by 14 and you decrease on an asset by 14 accounts as well, nothing has changed in terms of the asset balance. So we're gonna reduce or increase cash 14 and decrease receivable 14. Uh, cash, cash paid to creditors for 14, for $15,000 due. So we had, um, Accounts payable balance here of 19 at the end of December. And it, apparently they paid off 15,000 of it in January. So basically what happens is cash goes down by 15. Liabilities also go down by 15. We're gonna record a debit. Remember when you reduce liabilities, the normal balance in a liability account is a credit. So when you reduce liability, you're going to debit that balance. And of course, the asset's going to decrease by 15. Repair parts used during January, $4,000. All right, this, this is hint. 
debit repair expense account. Okay, anybody know how I would record this transaction? I'll give you a hint, we have a debit to repair parts expense. What do we credit? Okay, great. Debit expense and credit the inventory account. Remember, they bought some inventory. So this balance, they previously had 13,000. They bought another 4,000 in January. And now they use 4,000 in January. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna show the asset account inventory going down and equity going down by debiting repair parts expense. Okay, repair services performed during January. For cash, 6,000 and on account, 9,000. Now, what does that mean? They performed some repair services in January and they got paid $6,000 in cash and the rest of it's on account 9,000. All right, great. We're gonna debit the cash account. Asset goes up by 6,000. And they said they got the balance hasn't been paid to them yet. So it's on account, meaning it's an accounts receivable. So that means that they earned $15,000 in revenues, but they only got paid part of it in cash, and the rest of it's gonna be paid later. So the cash account, in this case, goes up 6,000, the receivable goes up 9,000, and the stockholders equity repair revenue goes up 15,000. Now, if, if if you don't follow this right now, uh, you need to go back and review this particular transaction because this involves a accounts receivable activity. So we're gonna debit accounts receivable, debit cash, 6,000 and credit repair revenue. Now notice we have three accounts, not two accounts that are impacted. Accounts receivable, cash debited, and revenue credit. That's okay. We can have multiple accounts as long as the debits in total. In this case, nine plus six, 15 equals the 15 credit. Wages, paid in cash. This is simple. Cash went out by three. Stockholders equity decreased by three by a debit to wage expense. Drawing during January was $3,000. Okay, how do we record drawing? Okay, in this case, we have, um, I think this is a sole proprietorship. This this guy, Jack Schellenkamp, owns and manages a repair service company. And he has an account called Capital. So if you go back to sole proprietorship structure in accounting records, if it's a sole proprietorship, we don't have stockholders equity, we have capital. One capital account for the owner. And whenever 
the owner um, takes out assets from the company. In this case, they're going to take out cash of three thousand dollars. In other words, he's withdrawing three thousand dollars from the company for his use. We're not going to debit dividends. We're going to debit the drawing account. This is a little different because this is not a stockholders, uh, not a corporation, but this is a sole proprietorship. And usually sole proprietorships would not have common stock. They'll have a capital account. And then they'll have a drawing account instead of a dividend account. Same concept, but it's just handled a little bit more differently than a corporation. But like I uh, mentioned earlier on, uh, the focus of this course is going to be on corporations. So that's why we're introducing you to um, corporate accounting uh, so early on in the, uh, in the class. But we don't want you to um, be confused with uh, sole proprietorship because sole proprietorship is very common business form in especially here in Hawaii. So if you were looking at this accounting records of a sole proprietorship, instead of seeing common stock, you would see the capital account. And the seeing, instead of dividend, you would see the drawing account. Okay, so cash goes down and drawing goes down. The entry would be a debit to the drawing account and a credit to the cash account. Okay, now if you were to run a trial balance, after you um, made all these entries, this is the end of the month. The last entry was the drawing account, end of January. And you take into consideration the uh, opening balances from the ending balances in December. You see the cash account at the end of the month of December had an $8,000 balance. And if you were to analyze the uh, journal entries that impacted the cash account on the ledger, you would see that what happened was you had an opening balance of eight and you had a credit of a thousand, another credit of 2000, a debit of 14, a credit of 15, a credit or a debit of six, a credit of three, and a credit of three. These are all the transactions that you recorded during the month of January and how it impacted the cash balance. Your cash account balance is $4,000 debit. So you know that the balance should be 4,000. And that is basically what happens when you do a trial balance. You pull off all the ending balances at the end of January from your uh, ledger accounts. And you add in any other activity that's not on your ledger balances, which would be all these impact to revenue, expense, and drawing accounts that are not, you don't have, you usually don't have an ending balance for these accounts. When you do the closing entries, you're gonna eliminate all these account balances, remember, in chapter four. And you get a $64,000 debit balance and a $64,000 credit balance. That would be your trial balance that you would complete. All right, so that kind of takes you through chapter two. Anybody have any questions? I'll tell you what, uh, let's take a two minute break, okay? Two minute break starting now.
Okay. Um, moving on to uh, chapter three. Chapter three is uh, titled Adjusting the Accounts. So we um, are at the point where we just completed the trial balance and now we need to go through a, uh, the process of adjusting certain um, accounts before we do the financial statements. So chapter three is learning the concept of accrual, accrued accounting. Accrual accounting, I'm sorry. And then um, preparing an adjusted trial balance. So uh, you know that from uh, your work on chapter three, we have to make adjusting entries and there are uh, two types of adjusting entries, deferrals and accruals. Deferrals uh, fall into two categories, prepaid expenses, expenses that are paid upfront in cash, but aren't used yet. And they're recorded as assets before they are used or consumed. This could include supplies, prepaid insurance, prepaid rent. And then there is another type of deferral called unearned revenues. That is revenues that are uh, received in cash, but we haven't earned it yet. So, so we have to record it as a liability because we haven't earned it yet. That is basically you're getting paid in advance for doing something in the future. So a lot of, a lot of companies expect to be paid for work in advance like construction companies, for example, generally won't start construction on a house or a, a building unless they get some form of advance payment by the uh, the purchaser because they have to go and buy equipment and supplies and so as much as they can they need some guaranteed money up front then you have accruals accrued revenues are revenues that are uh, earned but you haven't gotten paid yet that is very common in the business world. You do something first and then you get paid later. And then you have accrued expenses, expenses incurred but not yet paid in cash. That is very common in the business world too. You go out and you incur some expenses like salaries, but you don't have to pay it until later. Okay, so to make this distinction between journal entries, between what we consider the standard journal entries you learned in uh, chapter two, and journal entries referred to as adjusting entries we covered in chapter three, you should be familiar with the difference, right? So standard journal entries generally are th the following, an entry, debiting cash or crediting revenue. In other words, you did some services and you got paid in cash. An entry, debiting expenses and crediting cash. In other words, you incurred some expenses and you paid it with cash. An entry, purchasing something um, that is not an expense. So we refer to it as a non-cash asset and you paid for it in cash. An example would be prepaid insurance or inventory or supplies. And then an entry debiting cash and crediting liability. In other words, you um, received an advance payment from a customer but you didn't do the work yet. So you would have to record a credit to a liability account like unearned revenues. Adjusting journal entry, on the other hand, generally involves 
a debit to an asset account, like accounts receivable and a credit to revenue. In other words, you did something, you did some services, but you didn't get paid yet. So see how the difference is between these two, right? One is you got paid and the other ones you didn't get paid. So you would record that services performed by crediting revenue and debiting accounts receivable. And this next one is a debit to uh, expense, but you didn't pay for it yet. So you would create a liability account like salaries payable or uh, accounts payable. And then this case, you would make an adjusting entry debiting expense and crediting a non-cash asset. Like for example, debiting supply expense and crediting the asset account supplies. And then the, the last type of adjusting entry is debiting a liability and crediting the revenue. For example, you earn some revenues that you are paid for in advance. So you debit the unearned revenue account, which is the liability account and credit it the revenue account, which is stockholders equity. So what do you notice that's different between the standard and adjusting entries? Standard journal entries generally involve a debit or credit to the cash account So standard journal entry always involve a debit or credit to the cash account. And adjusting entries usually involve a debit or credit to a non-cash or liability account. Okay, so, so this is what we're learning in chapter three. These entries are normally made when you um, finish making all your standard journal entries during the month, and then you have to go in and then you have to make adjustment to certain accounts to properly state the balances in those accounts. Now, here is a simple example of what an accountant would have to do at the end of the month before they close their books to, to properly state all the balances in the accounts. For example, interest expense on notes payable of 479 needs to be accrued. In other words, the company has a notes payable, they owe some money to a bank, but they don't have to pay the bank or the, the uh, whoever is loaning the money, either the principal on the note or the ex interest expense on a note until a later period. So the accountant knows that to properly state the financial statements, they have to record this as a legitimate expense in the month it was incurred, which in this case is December. So if they were to record an accrual to record this as an expense, but they don't have to pay, pay it yet, how would, how would they accrue it? Anybody? care to uh, take a stab at it? What, it? what is the accrual entry to record interest expense on a notes payable of $479? What account will we debit? What account will we credit? Okay, that's pretty close, Mia. But remember in some of the assignments where you had interest expense associated with the notes payable, you need to record, there you go, you need to record the interest to an interest payable account and don't mix it up with the notes payable balance. We wanna make sure that we keeping track of 
the detailed activities by account and usually interest expense on a note is separate from the note in terms of recording the, the liability. So we record the uh, interest liability, not to the notes payable account, but to the interest payable account. We created a new account. So you're gonna debit the interest expense, you're gonna credit the interest payable. So that's the first accrual entry. How about services provided, but not recorded of 2023? In other words, the company performed some services and legitimately earned 2023, but it haven't been paid yet. The accountant knows that they have to record it in the month of December anyway. How do we record that? First, you gotta analyze, well, what accounts are involved, right? Services provided means revenue. Not recorded means there's a liability involved. Oh, I'm sorry. Not recorded means there's an asset involved. <laughs> yes, accounts receivable is impacted, not accounts payable. We got revenues that have been earned. You know that revenues that have been earned represents an increase to stockholders, equity, or capital. We're going to credit stockholders, equity, or capital. In this case, we're going to credit. And we're gonna to have to debit another account. We're gonna debit receivable. Okay. <clears throat> and then the last one is salaries earned by employees of 772 haven't been recorded. This is kind of like number one. This is an expense of 772 earned by employees during the month of December, but they haven't been paid yet. So the accountant knows they got to record it. Okay, so how do we record that, anybody? Debit, what expense, and credit, what liability? There you go. Okay, so we're going to debit an expense account, okay, selling wages, and we're gonna create a liability, selling wages payable. Okay, so this is very simple exercise in making accrual entries. So you know that these entries were not recorded during the month. They're recorded on the last day of the month, they're adjusting entries. So if you don't make these entries, then your accounting records are not gonna be complete. Okay, so going back to the chart here, remember that standard journal entries always involve a debit or a credit to the cash account. So you'll notice that these are all debits or credits to cash account. Accrued entries for accrued revenues generally require a debit to an asset for the revenue or a credit to a liability for expenses. Prepaid expenses require a debit or a credit to an asset account, which only comes from the standard journal entry where you debited the supplies when you purchased it, but when you use it, you usually have to credit it. And unearned revenues generally require you to debit the liability account that was created when you received the money in advance and then convert that into actual revenues by crediting the revenue account. Okay, this is another short 
uh, problem, and I'll just walk you through it real quickly. So, so you you, sh you should be able to do the adjusting entries from the information that's provided, right? So they give you the ending balance in these accounts at the end of September, and then they give you some information you need to know to make adjusting entries. So in this first example, they said that there was some um, inventory done on the supply and they determined that there was actually $1,000 still in inventory uh, at, the, at the end of the month. But the balance here says there's 2,700. So you knew, you know that this 2,700 was needs to be adjusted because it says when you did the physical count, you only have a thousand left. So that means that there was the difference of 1,700 used up. So we need to make an adjusting entry to record the portion of the uh, supplies that was consumed during the month of September. So to do that, this is the ledger of balance, 2,700, end of the month. And we know that a portion of it was used up. So we're going to record a debit to supply expense. And we're going to credit the supply account. So the supply expense gets debited and the supplies asset account gets credited. And you have an ending balance of 1,000 which agrees with the ending inventory that was done. Okay, so that's how you would solve that first accrual entry. Second, it says a two-year life insurance policy was purchased on June 4th for $4,800. Okay, now this is at the end of September, right? So now you got to think back to yourself. Oh, they bought a two-year life insurance policy on June 1 for 4,800. But at the end of the month, it shows a balance of 4,200. End of September. Okay, so, so what does that tell you happened? that between June 1 and August 31st, there was $600 that expired. Now, how do I know? How do I know that? Well, because when you recorded the $4,800 on June 1, and then you looked at the balance at the end of September 30th, there was only $4,200. That means that $600 of the 4,800 expired. Okay, now, if you read the problem, it says a two-year life insurance policy was purchased for 4,800. So two years is 24 months. So that means if you divide $4,800 by 24 months, that means every month $200 expires. If $200 a month expires, then you know that $600 is the difference between the June 1st balance and the September 30th balance. 200 divided into 600 means three months was used up. Well, three months covers the period June 1, July 1, uh, June, July, and August. So going into September 1 is the fourth month. So we need to make an accrual entry to record the fourth month of the insurance expense that expired during the month of September. So you look at the insurance account, 
and that's $4,200 balance. How much expired? As I said, right? It's $200 a month. So you need to record a debit to expense of 200 and a credit to the prepaid insurance account of 200. That will give you a correct ending balance of $4,000 at the end of September. Uh, how many of you guys follow that? How many of you didn't follow that? <laughs> how many don't know if you followed it or not followed it? Kind of just don't want to say either way in case someone didn't follow it needs to be repeated. It means you understand what I just walked you through. Was that Ethan? Uh, yes, that was me. And did I can't you, really read. Hmm? Did you understand what the logic I, I went walked you through? Yes, more or less. Okay. <clears throat> so I assume that if you understand it, that's then. The rest of the class understands it. Is it. Would that be a correct? That is a harder assumption to make when I can't look around the class and do that shrug thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but this is what you got to be able to uh, read between the lines when you're doing adjusting entries, yeah? Yeah, let's go on to the next one. Equipment depreciated $6,000 per year. Now, this is going to be covered in Chapter 9, depreciation. But basically, it's telling you that every year, the equipment account, which has 16200 balance in it, we have to depreciate $6,000 per year. So when you're looking at the accrual entry for uh, depreciation, you're dealing with two accounts, the asset account and the accumulated depreciation account for that asset. So we have information that 6,000 expires at the end of the year. So you now you gotta figure out, okay, how much expires monthly? So if, that, if they're telling you 6,000 per year, that means $500 per month. You need to make an entry to book depreciation expense 500, credit the accumulated depreciation account 500. You see the accumulated depreciation account balances 1,000 at the end of December, September, going to credit debit this expense account depreciation 500 and credit accumulated depreciation 500. So your ending balance at the end of September would be 1,500. And then the last one is rent received in advance. The remain unearned September 30th is 500. Then you go up to the rent revenue account is 1200. How much has been earned in the month of September if they're telling you that the balance unearned is 500? Anybody? Seven hundred. Okay. That means 700 was used up. I mean, 700 was earned. So we're going to show, and you look at the trial balance, it says the unearned revenue account is 1,200 credit balance. And you look at the unearned revenue account on the ledger, it's 1,200 balance here. So we're going to debit. The owner revenue account 700 because they said there's an ending balance of 500. That means 700 was earned. To get to the 500 ending balance, you got to credit the unearned revenue account or the uh, you got to debit the unearned revenue account 700 to get a remaining 500 balance. And then you have the credit to the rent revenue account for 700. Okay, so that. Basically what uh, chapter three was all about.
moving on to chapter four. Chapter four is after you complete all your journal entries, adjusting entries, you would have run an adjusted trial balance. And now you can prepare your financial statements. And after you're finished with your financial statements, you can do your closing entries and run off a post-closing trial balance. So this is the cycle, right? To get to the uh, ready for the next accounting period. So the financial statements are the reports that summarize everything that happened during the accounting period. You have the income statement, the balance sheet, the owner equity statement, and the statement of cash flow. Income statement reports revenues minus expenses resulting in net income or net loss for a specific period. Balance sheet shows the balance at the end of the period for assets, liability, and owners or stockholders equity at the end of the month. And owner's equity statement shows you the owner's equity balance at the during the period. Summarize the changes in owner's equity during the period. And then the cash flow statement reports how much cash came in and how much cash went out during the period. For this uh, point in time in the class course, we're not gonna hold you responsible for the statement of cash flow because it's a very uh, complicated statement to prepare and understand. We will cover that in the last chapter of this class chapter 12. And I'm actually gonna give you two weeks to, to uh, work on the cash flow statement because it is so complicated. But you should be familiar with the first three statements. Now, the worksheet is a method for you to prepare the financial statements. And basically in the old days before we had computers, this is how accountants would actually prepare the financial statements by putting together a worksheet. And an income statement is generally prepared off the worksheet, income statement columns, and the balance sheet and owner's equity statements are generally prepared from the balance sheet columns on the worksheet. Now, this is what the worksheet basically looks like. It's, it's a big spreadsheet, basically, that lists all your account balances, starting with your trial balance, and then all your adjusting entries, and then your adjusted trial balance, and then your income statement column, income statement balances from the adjusted trial balance, and your balance sheet balances from your adjusted trial balance. So all of this information that you need to prepare an income statement and a balance sheet and owner's equity statement comes off your adjusted trial balance here, which of course is prepared origi originally from your first trial balance covered in chapter two, and then your adjusted adjustments in chapter three and your adjusted trial balance from chapter three will give you your balances for you need to prepare your income statement and your balance sheet. So if I were just to show you how you prepare your income statement off the manual trial balance worksheet, basically you would go back and prepare your adjusted trial balance And from your adjusted trial balance, you can prepare your income statement and balance sheet totals. And once you get those totals, you can actually pluck the numbers out of your columns from your worksheet and into your statement itself. Now, the, the key points of the income statement is that the income statement is basically a formal financial statement, a report, summarizing how much money the company made during the accounting period. 
in this case, the counting period is for the month ended October 31st. Now, some financial statements show uh, for the year ended October 31st, which means that it's for the 12 month period ending October 31st, or it could show for the six month ended October 31st, which means it's a six month ending October 31st. In other words, it's, it's a six month summary. And this example is just for the month. And an income statement is always presented by listing the name of the company at the top, the name of the statement and the period ending. And the income statement is always for a period of time. It's not for the end, uh, end of the month, it's for the month itself in this case. So all you're gonna do is you're gonna report revenues in this case, there was 10,600 revenues. So we're gonna show revenues. In this case, we only have one revenue category. And then you can follow that by listing all the expenses. And you have many expenses to get the total expenses at the bottom here. And the difference between revenue and expenses, of course, is your net income or net loss. In this case, the net income is 2860. So that is basically telling you the company realized $10,600 in revenues, whether it was collected in cash or not. In other words, we earned 10,600. And if we didn't collect all 10,600 in cash, then part of it would still show up under liabilities as unearned revenue up here. And all the expenses that were incurred to get those revenues, whether they were paid in cash or not. All right, so that's the income standard, right? So that's good, right? We made some income. If we made some losses, it would show net loss down here. And it would be a, a credit balance sitting in the income statement column on the worksheet. Balance of uh, the owner's equity statement shows a change in owner's equity from the beginning of the month to the end of the month. Now, owner's equity is what the owner realized uh, in terms of profit minus losses, minus dividends or drawings during the period. In this case, the capital account for this company was zero at the beginning of the period. That is because it's a new company. It just started off business on October 1, so it didn't have any capital balance. During the month, the owner invested $10,000 of his own assets. So there's a credit to that account, the capital account. And during the month, the company earned income. So that's going to increase the capital's balance, 2860. So the two um, increases to the capital account was from the original investment of 10,000 and the company's net income earned of 2860. So the balance, 12,860 is then reduced by the drawing. The owner took out $500 for personal use. So the capital balance at the end of the uh, period, in this case, was 12,360. That is basically how you construct the equity statement. This is showing you, remember assets equal liability plus equity. This is just showing you that the equity balance for this company is 12,360 at the end of October. Now we go to do the balance sheet. You need the equity balance, 12,360 to complete the balance sheet. The balance sheet will show you the balance at the end of the period. It's not for the month, it's for the end of the period, end of the month. So that's why you don't see for the month ending, it just says October 31. Now this is very important for you to remember. 
what a balance sheet shows. A balance sheet shows liability assets, balances, liability balances, and equity balance at the end of the month, end of the period. So all you do is go to the worksheet and pull off all your assets. And you can see the assets are scattered around the worksheet. And then you pull off all of your liabilities. Like notes payable, accounts payable, unearned revenue, interest payable, salaries payable. And you get total liabilities. Now notice assets total 21,960 and liabilities totals 9,550. And you note the accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. Remember the equity we calculated was 12,360. That's the missing piece to balance out your balance sheet. That will bring up your total liability and equity to 21,910, which equals your total assets. So that's, that's basically summarizes the um, three financial statements that you should be familiar with. The income statement showing you how much revenues, expenses, and net income or profit for the period. The equity statement showing you the change, increase or decrease in the owner's equity. And the balance sheet showing you the total assets equals liabilities plus equity. Okay, so after the financial statements are completed and are going to be issued to the owners or to the managers for review, then the accountant has to close the books. Technically, the closing of the books only occurs once a year at the end of the period or the year. Basically, you have to get all the accounts ready for the next period by zeroing out all the revenue expense and drawing accounts. They're the temporary accounts. They have to create a special account called income summary where you move all your revenue expenses into, and then you transfer that balance to your equity. Okay, so this is the final entries that the accountant has to make at the end of the year normally. Four steps, all temporary accounts, and you gotta know the temporary accounts are revenue expenses and drawing or dividend are closed, zeroed out. The permanent accounts are not closed, they're left alone. Whatever the balance is, they're gonna be reported on your final trial balance. They're your assets, your liability, and your capital accounts. So closing the books basically again means we got to zero out all the temporary accounts, revenue, expenses, drawing or dividends, and the income summary to your capital account, permanent accounts, assets, liabilities, and capital account. So this account you see here on the summary is eventually gonna be zeroed out and transferred to the capital account. Closing account only applies to the temporary accounts. So four steps, right? Close credit balances and revenue accounts, income summary, close debit balance and expense accounts, to income summary, close income summary to owner's capital and close drawing account to owner's capital, drawing or dividend account. So here's a summer, uh, a quick schematic of the closing process. We have the revenue account has an ending balance of 10,600. We have the expense accounts ending balance of 7,740. Now we're gonna close both the revenue and expense accounts to income summary. Income summary is created just for the specific purpose of closing. So we create this income summary account and we're gonna move the balance in the revenue and the balance in expense into income summary by debiting the revenue account 10,600, makes it go to zero and 
crediting the income summary, 10,600. Remember we're under double entry accounting system. So this 10,600 that was previously over here is now in the income summary. We're gonna close the expense account by crediting it for the amount that's in the ledger, make it go to zero and push it into the income summary. So the account that was balance that was previously in this account is now sitting in the income summary. The difference between those two entries is the net income, 2860. Now we're gonna close that to capital or stockholders equity by debiting that account and crediting capital. So this income summary is now zero. And everything that was recorded in revenues, expenses during the month, transferred to income summary, balanced credit 2860 has now been moved into capital. So the capital account of the owner increased by 2860. And then the last closing entry is to close the drawing or dividend account back to the capital account. And we have 500 that was taken out by the owner. We're gonna zero that out by crediting it and moving it to the capital account. That's gonna reduce the capital balance. So that means that the capital account in total for the month increased by 2360. That's how much the uh, owner's capital in this example improved during the month. 2360 because it made that income of 2860. It's, it sold 10,600 in revenues and incurred 7,740 expenses, made 2860, but it took out 500 for its owner, took out $500 in drawing for its own personal use. So his interest in the company improved by 2360. Now, note that I closed the drawing account directly to the capital account. I didn't close this drawing account up to income summary because drawing is not considered an expense of the company. It's a concern of, it's considered a return of capital to the owner. So we never take and push that into the income summary. You would just take it directly out of the capital account. So when you're finished with this process, the revenue accounts have been zeroed out. The expense accounts have been zeroed out. The income summary has been zeroed out and the drawing account has been zeroed out. Everything's been pushed into the capital account. So I have a question. Part of this was messing with me last. Can I get some clarification really fast? Okay, what? go ahead. Uh, I'm trying to find the part on the uh, chapter four assignments, but I didn't realize uh, Wiley Plus locks you out for review <laughs> afterwards. Uh, but to the best of my memory, when going through the uh, balancing out the accounts, see, we would start off with using the balancing the expenses accounts and then doing the income summary to balance that out and then the balancing out the revenues accounts. And then the third part had to do with retained earnings versus the income statements. Mm -hmm. Getting that number. So I, I figured it out like the, the pattern was we're pulling from subtracting, but why do we do that? Um, okay. Why do we do what? So the because we the, the debit and credit and value for balancing the income summary to the retained earnings goes off of the retained earnings from subtracting your or the difference between your revenue and expenses, but not the retained earnings on the sheets. Is that correct? Okay, yeah. Um that 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 was what I was trying to explain a little while ago. This yeah, is there like a why? <laughs> no, this is um 
based on a sole proprietorship accounting, if you were doing a corporation, you wouldn't have owner's capital. You, you would have stockholders equity. Let me go back to that. Um, see if I know how to get out of this. Back at the beginning here, where I was trying to explain the structure of uh, stockholders equity. Okay, well, yeah, what's what's kind of missing from this is we have what we call retained earnings. Maybe I got to go back and and. Um, uh, you can review the homework. You have to do a weird thing. Let me find like try to put a better word. This. Uh, just a second here, okay. Yeah, this this is the part that um, causes a little confusion because bef before this, when this uh, yeah, class was conducted, we didn't cover stockholders equity because it would be too confusing. But for some reason, the uh, the authors of the textbook decided to introduce uh, stockholders equity early on in uh, this introductory uh, accounting course. So I need to kind of help you understand why. Do you see this um, new slide I posted? You see it? Uh, this shareholder equity paid in capital? Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at um, shareholder equity, that's like stockholders equity, right? Yeah. Okay. Should be. In the, in, the, in the corporation, we have what is called retained earnings. You see it up here? Yes. Okay. That account represents all the earnings the corporation made from the very day it started business. So if you look at Apple, Apple started business in the 1980s sometime. If you ever go to Apple's balance sheet and look under the uh, balance sheet and look under stockholders equity, you would see an account called retained earnings. That, that account represents all the profits the corporation recorded from the day it started business to the current accounting period, cumulative. Okay, so here's an example. This is an example of stockholders equity for this corporation. Now you can see how complicated it is because there's paid in capital, capital stock, that's common stock. There's preferred stock, common stock, additional paid in capital, total paid in capital. Then they have down here, a thing called retained earnings. Okay, this, this is what you're gonna see on a, a corporate balance sheet. So what is it? Uh, well, I was trying to explain to you. Let's see if I can find a slide that Bill illustrates that. See, this is what we'll be covering in, uh, in uh, chapter 11, I think. Okay, anyway, so make a long story short. This, this is the account that's specifically set up. It's called retained earnings, and it's exactly what it means. It's earnings that have been retained by the business. That makes sense? Yes, and I think I got where the, uh, the, the disconnect was happening in my homework. Yeah, it's, it's earnings that the company kept in its business from revenues minus expenses equal profits minus dividends. Yeah, so on the okay. so like question six and seven was where it was uh, messing with yeah. me. Yeah, 
the first part has the retained earnings and it was listed for, yeah. for seven six seven thousand six hundred. And then I thought that would be the retained earnings for uh, part A, uh, but then that's the retained earnings from the previous existence of the company. When we're balancing the sheets, we yeah okay okay use that good once, right is yeah. that correct yeah okay <laughs> I think I get it now thank you okay now um, I'm I'm just trying to explain for you and for the uh, rest of the class that let's go back to the slide. You see on this chart, we don't have retained earnings, right? Yes, yeah. That is because this is not a corporation, but this is how a, how a sole proprietorship would structure its accounts. They just have owner's capital and owner's drawing, right? But in a corporation, you would have retained earnings where the uh, profits would be book two and the dividends would be book two. So that's the only difference, the same thing, but it's just called something different. Okay, now having walked you through this and these are all the closing entries that would have been put put into the, uh, into the journal before they can finally close their accounts. So there's the revenue closing entry, there's the expense closing entry income summary and capital. So uh, this is a quick example of a closing entry. It says close the entries that affect stockholders equity. What, what would we close here? This is a real simple problem. Anybody know? Net income and dividends. Okay, how would we close it? Debit income should be debit account, debit, and income summary should be credit. Okay. And uh, dividends should be credit, and then the stockholders are uh, owned at retained earnings should be debit side. Okay. And then yeah, I, I, you got it. I think you got it. In this case. So this this is a see this this is this is an example of corporation now right instead of hitting that capital account like I showed you in the previous example this is a corporation because how do you know it's a corporation because it says dividends and it says common stock and saying the same drawing uh, versus capital so if it was a corporation the closing entry would have been to uh, close out your net income to the retained earnings account instead of the capital account. And you would close out the dividends that were paid to the retained earnings account instead of to the capital account. So this first entry will reduce or increase your retained earnings. And this second entry will reduce your retained earnings. So the net increase in the retained earnings account is how much? How much did the retained earnings increase for this period? 3,000. Yeah. So this, so the company's retained earnings or which is part of the stockholders equity went up by 3,000. <clears> okay. Okay. Um, we're running short on time. So I'm going to skip this problem. This is basically a closing entry problem, but I'll just quickly go through it so you can see what happens. You have to figure out what accounts to close to income summary, that's the revenue and expenses. And then you figure out the difference between revenue expenses and close it to the capital. And then the drawing gets closed to capital. And then the second problem, same thing, right? You close out the revenues, the income summary, then you have to look at all your expenses and I just combined one entry, but in actuality, you have to close every expense account separately. Then the difference between revenue and expenses gets closed out to capital and then 
the drawing gets closed out to capital. All right, the last part of chapter four was basically uh, a discussion of the balance sheet. And as most of you should be familiar now, balance sheet is basically a listing of all your assets and your liabilities and equity. Now for purposes of presentation, a balance sheet is generally listed in terms of classifications. So you have on the asset side, you have current assets, long-term investments, property plan and equipment and intangible assets as classifications and liabilities. You have current liabilities, long-term liabilities as classifications. And then you have your owners and stockholders equity. Now, the reason why we have it this way is to make it easy for the reader of a financial statements to read what the balance sheet consists of. So if everybody understands that uh, balance sheets assets normally consist of both current and long-term assets and liabilities consist of long and uh, current and long-term liabilities, then it's easy to zero in on what you're interested in looking at. And the reason um, why this is so important is if you are the owner of shares of a company, or you're the owner of a business, you're gonna be interested in looking at your company's financial statements at the end of every accounting period to see how you're doing. And the balance sheet is very important financial statement because it shows you how much assets you own, offset by how much liabilities you have, and the rest is part of your equity. And one of the big topics uh, is the term liquidity. What does liquidity mean? Basically, it's measuring the quickness of cash, how quickly an item can be converted into cash. Now, if you look at a classified balance sheet, usually what we do is we list assets in terms of their liquidity. The most liquid assets get listed first. That is, starting with current assets, which generally includes cash or other items that can be sold or used up within one year or the operating cycle. Now, if you look at Apple's balance sheet, as I show here <coughs> from uh, 2013, <coughs> you can see that it shows under assets, current assets and it list all your current assets and then it's which includes cash short term marketable securities accounts receivable inventories etc they have total current assets of 73 73 what it says in millions right so this is 73 million dollars of current assets then long-term marketable securities of 106 million, and then property, planning, equipment, so forth and so on. And you get total assets of $207 million and then it does current liabilities of accounts payable, accrued expenses, 43 million, deferred revenues, long-term debt, 16 million, Et cetera, et cetera. And then it's total shareholders equity, $123 million. Okay, now you're you're the owner of the company. What what are you what are you interested in looking at? Well, we're not going to get into this until we get into the later chapters. But what you're you know, what you should be interested in is how liquid is the company? What what do you mean liquid? Well. It says the company owes a total of $83 million in debt. And it has assets of $207 million in assets. Is this company liquid or not liquid? Very liquid or lightly liquid? Anybody have any comments?
Liquid? Is this company Liquid? Okay, let me ask you this. Is this company not Liquid? Okay, Jesse, why is it Liquid? Or anybody can help Jesse? Why is it liquid? Why is this company liquid? Current asset amounts are bigger than current liability. Okay, yes, yes, yes. I'm just curiosity, Jesse, can you see the chat box? Yeah, I guess you can, you're typing it in, right? But how about you, um, Min Hei, is that how you pronounce your name? Yes, Min Hei. Is okay. all right. Can you see the chat box? Yes. Okay. Okay. So yeah, the answer is they have a lot of assets compared to their liabilities. In fact, they have much more assets than liabilities. So that what does that mean when they say they're liquid? What does that mean they can do? Well, if the company had to stop business today and had to pay off all of its liabilities, do they have enough assets to pay off their liabilities? Yes or no? Okay, but how much cash do they have? Estimation, I wanna say no, they can't. If they have to pay today, they Without to, any prep they have, or how they could look, look at here, right? You have $43 million worth of current liabilities. Yeah. And then another uh, 16, 17 million, another 20 million in long term total. They have to they owe $83 million to creditors. If you look up here, they have 14 million in cash. If they have to pay today, they could not pay. All of Even their debts. They were to liquidate their, you know, their. Yeah, their they stock. would have. They would have to liquidate their debts, right? Okay. Now, if you look at their assets, what part of their debts could they easily liquidate and convert into cash? Besides cash, how about short-term securities? Yes or no? You could, but you'd have to account for the. Okay. What are, what, so, cash. what are more, what are short-term market securities? That means that they have stocks in other companies they could probably easily trade on the open market and get cash for. How about accounts receivable? Could they could they go to their um, to their uh, customers and say, "Hey, I need my money now." Yeah, they can do that. And what's the chances they will likely get their money? Hopefully good, but if not, yeah, they got to go to collections. How about inventories? Can they convert that to cash right away? Probably not. They probably would have to take a hit or take a haircut if they wanted to put their inventory on the market. Okay, so this is the example of liquidity, right? If you're looking at a company to invest, one of the things you need to check on is how liquid are they? Because usually companies that get into trouble have too much debt and not enough assets to cover the debts when they get into uh, problems short on cash. So in the case of Apple, Apple is considered pretty liquid. I would say Apple is a fairly liquid company. Now, why is this so critical is because a lot of times you will read stories about companies that go bankrupt. Now, what is in the news right now that's big news that has hurt the stock market around the world today is this company, Evergrande Real Estate Development Company, 
located in China. Anybody know anything about it? It was causing a lot of the China crash right now, isn't it? Yeah, it's a it's the one of the largest, if not the largest, real estate development companies in China that has been building massive apartment complexes and shopping malls and everything for years now, and uh, basically building those developments with money borrowed from the banks and from private investors, retail investors, and they suddenly find themselves, they don't have enough <clears throat> cash to pay off the interest that's coming due and the bonds that are coming due this year. Um, something to the tune of $300 billion worth of bonds that they owe, 80 billion is coming due already and they don't have the money to pay for it. And the way they got themselves into this mess is they've been able to raise money from banks and private investors, retail investors, the mom and pops, the, 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 the uh, individuals uh, in China who are looking to make money by buying into uh, stocks or, or buying bonds and uh, other wealth management uh, instruments, which help fund uh, Evergrande to keep building, but they can't, they find themselves now they can't pay because they don't have the cash to pay the big principal that's coming due. So if you ever decide to uh, invest in common stock or into a company, you have to be careful when you're looking at their financials to make sure that they're not overly leveraged. Okay, that's that's why this uh, concept of liquidity is, is uh, so important and was covered in uh, uh, chapter four. Okay, um, so one of the things you should be able to do is be able to classify what is a uh, asset liability or equity and whether it's current or long-term. So I'll just go through this real quickly for you. Building is an asset long-term, accounts payable is a liability current, expenses is neither and so forth and so on, right? So this is something you should be familiar with already. Okay, that's all I'm going to talk about. That was basically the session. So, yeah, go I ahead. A quick, quick question about this. So, on the test yesterday, there was it was either building or land that was held for like long term investment. Is that was that considered like because it was asking like land building equipment? Is that considered that or is that considered like a um what was the other thing that they could classify it as? I can't remember off the top. Yeah, so I, I couldn't remember. I couldn't figure out that it was it was like a building hold for an invest. Like, is that considered an investment? That was that was on the quiz, right? Let me see if I can yeah. pull it up. It's 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 hard because they locked you out, but here we go. Here we go. Oh, okay, you know what? I'm gonna. I didn't know you guys were locked out. I go. I'm gonna go back and lock and open it up where you can go back and review it. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I mean, you can. You just have to go assignments and then you click on it. Click on uh, submission details, and then it should allow you. Oh, okay. You, there is a way to do it, then. Yeah, I think it's kind of maybe not the intended purpose. But yeah, I think so. this is uh, um, um, a, a new version of uh, the Wiley Plus mm. that, that uh, they keep changing the rules on it. So I'll have to go back and check on that again. Okay, back to your uh, back to your question. Yeah, <clears throat> let me. Um, Pull up this slide. Okay. Um, what is the difference between um, long term investments and plant assets, right? Or property, plant, and equipment? And what you have to understand is that. The definition of property, plan, and equipment is this. 
first of all, it has to have long, useful life. That means it's generally more than one year. A building, um, a machinery, equipment normally has a life of more than one year. You agree with that, right? Supplies, on the other hand, or inventory generally gets consumed within one year. So we don't consider that under the property plan equipment. We consider that current assets. It has to be used in operations. If it's not used in operations, it's not part of property plan equipment. It's therefore, it's subject to the concept of depreciation, which we'll cover in more depth in chapter nine. Okay, what is the definition of property plan and equipment? Land and land improvements, if it's used in operations. Buildings, equipment, machinery, furniture, computers, vehicles, less accumulated depreciation, these are all considered property plan equipment. Okay. Now go back and remember what I just covered has to be used in operations. Okay, now you go back to <clears throat> long-term investments. Could be stocks in other companies, could be bonds in other companies, other long-term assets not used in operating activities such as land or buildings. All right, so you could have land or buildings sitting in both long-term investments or plant and assets or property plant equipment. And the only difference is if it's not used in operations, if it's just they bought land for speculation and they're just sitting idle, not doing anything for the business, it's long-term investment. If it's a building they invested and it's not doing anything, they're not using it for anything. You put in a long-term investment. If it's being used, for the business, you put in a plan assets. Does that clarify that question? Yeah, that, that clarifies it. Okay. Okay, now anybody have any questions? Because I'm finished. If I can ask questions about the uh, logistics end of the quiz, like if you had liberty to give these, yeah, basically, or out of the exam, is it? Do you know uh, if it's formatted more so like the quizzes uh, on the ED, uh, the Wiley Plus, where it is in a multiple choice format, kind of fill in the blanks, true or false, or is it formatted more like the CLSOs, the homework, where there's a lot of uh, formulas and then uh, typing it, numbers uh, as human error? Okay, so I will uh, give you some clues here, okay? I appreciate it. The answer is, except for the CSLOs, all of the above. How's that? So it will have both multiple choice and fill in the blank with the sim like similar to the homeworks. It will be mostly and I, I give you a hint, it's only 44 questions. You get two hours for 44 questions. <clears throat> and it's mainly multiple choice, some fill in the banks, some drop down menus, and some short, uh, how should I say it, problems like we just went over. Yeah, we like put in the values they gave you kind of thing. Huh? Like putting putting in the values and all that. Yeah. Got it. Filling in the <laughs> blanks, right? So it's, you know, there's like maybe 30 multiple choice questions where you, some of them you're going to have to calculate. Okay, if I give you two numbers, what's the third number? You know what I mean? I think I'm mostly just asking to make sure that it's not 40 questions of the CLSO, which is worth five points and took no, me no, like no, 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 no. You guys will never be able to finish. <clears throat> so, so, so let's take a multiple choice question. If I say assets is this, and liabilities is this, what is stockholders equity? 
you know, you ch- pick from four four answers. You follow? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, and then there's going to be some more uh, complicated multiple choice, but it's it's a multiple choice, so you you have to pick from four four choices, and you have to do a calculation. <clears throat> Okay, so again, just to remember now, uh, I'm gonna post the exam so you can access it anytime between six and 10 o'clock on Thursday evening. It's time sensitive, so you get two hours to complete it. So once you start, you can't stop and go and exit out because once you exit out, you're done, you can't go back in. So you need to start at least by uh, eight o'clock if you want the full two hours. It's a combination of uh, multiple choice short questions. Every question, whether it's a multiple choice or a short problem is algorithmic. That means that every student gets assigned the same question but different values. So if you're sitting there next to your you're um, another student taking the exam at the same time and looking at the same question, every every question would be the different. You, you follow that, right? Similar to the homework. Yeah. Oh, this is not proctored, so you, you don't, nobody's checking you. You can take it from home or Starbucks or wherever you wanna go. Make sure you read the questions clearly and uh, Unlike the homework, you only get one chance to get the right answer. Once you submit your answer, you won't tell you whether you're right or wrong. They just tell you, you submit the answer. Uh, don't try to go back into Y plus um, assignments or quizzes, because if you do that, you'll run out of time anyway, because you'll be spending too much time looking to figure out how to do the answer, do the, do the answer and but you might, you, might, you might end up running out of time. You should have all your notes ready for the exam. Write all your notes. I would suggest to all my students to write everything down by hand so you memorize it in your, <clears throat> in your brain. At least you've got something on paper that you can relate to to help you with the answering the question. And uh, your scores won't be posted until everybody finishes the exam. And that's, that's ask, it. Yeah, go ahead. Ask clarification regarding uh, number eight. Yeah. So it's open notes, but not open book. Are, are we allowed to use the book through Wiley Plus? Um, I'm, 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 sh- I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to access the book, yeah. Okay. Just, uh... But I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try to attempt to go and uh, look at your homework or look at your quiz assignments. Uh, as I said, you know, two hours is a lot of time, but <clears throat> some of the some of the problems will, will will eat up a lot of time, even if they're short. So 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 anyway, that's that's it. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, well, that's it then. Uh, thanks for joining in uh, um, chapter five uh, assignments will be uh, posted uh, probably uh, shortly, but you don't have to worry about that for now. All right, so if you're finished, you can check out. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Okay. All right, you guys can check out.